Well, last week marked yet another round of wacky weather throughout the United States. There were giant lightning strikes near the St. Louis Arch. There were huge snowstorms in parts of Montana and Minnesota, and enormous hailstones fell in Kansas. Uh, the unusual seems to be the norm these days with the weather, which brings us to the best-selling author of Hot, Flat, and Crowded, our friend, New York Times columnist Tom Friedman, and Heidi Cullen, who is the chief climatologist at Climate Central. And they are here today because they're both involved in our partner Showtime's new documentary on climate change. It is called Years of Living Dangerously. Tom, this is a multi-part uh, series. Uh, you uh, take part in one of the episodes. Episodes. Uh, what's the bottom line here? What did you all find out? Well, uh, Bob, this actually is a, it's a nine-part series, and people can watch the first one tomorrow, actually, on YouTube, yearsoflivingdangerously.com. We'll mm -hmm. get it for free. Um, for me, it's been really the most remarkable uh, documentary project I've ever been uh, involved with. I got to do uh, looking at environmental and climate stresses in the Middle East. So I actually go to Syria and show how the drought in Syria is connected to the revolution, get to go to Yemen, look at the first city in the world that may run out of water, um, and, uh, and then to Egypt, look how climate stresses were involved in, in the revolution there. Um, uh, Participating in the series, you know, we have Arnold Schwarzenegger, Matt Damon, Harrison Ford, Dom Cheadle, Mark Bittman, really um, Leslie Stahl from, from CBS. Remarkable group of people. The whole idea is to bring this home through personal stories, and it does it amazingly effectively. Well, well, Heidi, uh, what what is the conclusion of this series? Uh, you were the chief science advisor for this series. Uh, what do you say to those who uh, question whether global warming exists, for example? Well, you know, I think the series meshes very nicely with the IPCC reports that have just come out that basically show you know, conclusively that climate change is very real, we're experiencing it right now, and that it is man-made, that it is primarily caused by the burning of fossil fuels, oil, coal, natural gas, and that we're already feeling the pain from it, right? So, you know, the title, The Years of Living Dangerously, I think it really hits home that, that these are important years that we're living right now. We're, we're beginning to see the effects. The effects will only get worse, and if we do nothing to stop it, you know, we're going to look back and and ask ourselves why didn't we do something when we had the opportunity the IPCC report made very clear that now is the time to act well uh, help me with this uh, for example the the recent storms we've had uh, the thing that hit New Jersey uh, big Sandy and all of that is that because of global warming because of climate change there is no doubt in my mind that Hurricane Sandy was made worse as a result of global warming, specifically the sea level rise component. So you think about that massive storm surge during Hurricane Sandy, there's an additional foot of sea level rise that we can tie directly to additional flooding. You look at New Jersey, for example, an additional 25 square miles were flooded. That's about 40,000 people that were impacted who wouldn't have been. And then think about how bad Sandy was, 60 billion in damage, more than 125 dead. And then fast forward to a point where sea level is now four feet higher, and we're talking about a sandy level flooding event in a place like New Jersey happening every year. So we've got to think about the fact that if we don't do anything now, our grandchildren are going to be dealing with risks they cannot cope with. But, you know, uh, Tom, let me just ask you this question. Uh, in our politics now, everything breaks on these ideological lines. Uh, there's, uh, it, it just breaks. Uh, is there such a break in the scientific community? How does the scientific community come down on this whole idea of climate change? Well, let, me, let me put it in personal terms. So um, your, your uh, son or daughter um, has a disease, and you go to 100 doctors. 97% of them, 97 of the 100, say this is the cause and this is the cure. And 3% say this is the cause, this is the cure. That's what it is on the climate science. 97% of experts say this, 3% say that. And conservatives are saying, I'm going to go with the 3%. That's not conservative. That's Trotskyite radical, okay, that you would go with the 3%, not the 97%. To pick up on something that, that Heidi said, I actually don't like to use the term global warming because that sounds so cuddly. To a Minnesota boy, Bob, that sounds like golf in February. Mm -hmm. I much prefer the term global weirding. Okay, because that's actually what happens. The hots get hotter, the wets get wetter, the dries get drier, and the more violent storms, for the reasons Heidi outlined, are most likely to become 
more severe. And that's what we saw in Syria. We saw a four-year drought, worst in Syria's modern history, that preceded the revolution there and produced a million refugees that basically laid the predicate for that revolution. Uh -oh. The World Health Organization put out a report last month saying that seven million people worldwide were killed by air pollution, one in eight deaths tied to dirty air, which is twice that previously estimated. How can that be? Well, it can be because while we're cutting back on coal use here, Bob, we're, we're like an addict who's given up um, heroin, but we've decided to go into the business of being a pusher because we're sending that coal all over the world and other people are still burning it. And um, it gets back to a, a central point. You know, some people say, you know, climate change is a hoax, to which I say, you know, if it's a hoax, it'll be the greatest hoax that ever happened to us because if we do everything we need to do toward a climate change and it doesn't happen, we will like, be like someone who trained for the Olympic triathlon and the triathlon never came. We will be stronger, we will have cleaner air, we will have healthier uh, society, we will have more innovative industries, we will have a stronger dollar, we will be less dependent on the worst petro dictators in the world starting with Vladimir Putin and the likes of him. So to me, if it's a, I, I don't think it's a hoax in the least, but if it were and we did everything we could to prevent it, we'd only be stronger. By the way, if it's not a hoax and we don't do anything, we will be a bad biological experiment. Heidi, what do we need to do? I think that uh, these reports from the scientific community make clear that strong, sustained leadership is so important. A new Pew report came out, second year in a row, China, who we've all seen these awful pictures of pollution in China. China is the world's leader in investment in renewables. 54 billion for China, about 37 billion for the U.S. We need to really move towards making this a nonpartisan issue here in the States. And there's a great scene actually in the Years Project where Bob Inglis sits down. Bob Inglis, Repub former Republican congressman from South Carolina, sits down with Michael Grimm, a Republican from Staten Island, where I grew up. Grimm has just been dealing with the awful impacts of Sandy, and Inglis says to him, you know what, I'm a Republican, and I believe in climate change. You've just been through this harrowing experience where you've seen your community ravaged by, in part, climate change. Maybe it's time to rethink this. You know, the Chinese certainly don't treat this as a, as a partisan issue, and I think that's really the direction that we need to move in. Tom, but tell me about uh, your, your part of this, where you went into Syria, of all places. So um, between 2006 and 2010, Syria actually experienced uh, the worst drought in its modern history. And as a result, about a million Syrian farmers and herders left the countryside, flocked to the cities, where they completely overstressed, already stressed cities, stressed in part by Iraqi refugees as well. And um, it basically, when the match was lit then in Tunisia, starting all these Arab Springs, so climate change didn't cause Assad to kill Syrians, be a repressive dictator, but it was what Heidi said, it was a stressor that when the revolution came, you had a million climate change who the refugees who the Syrian regime had completely ignored, a million environmental refugees, and so when the revolution came, they couldn't wait to join. All right. Well, thank you all very, very much. This sounds like a, just a fascinating series.